and to COVID-19 on our minds constantly. Of course, as Auckland's Level 3 lockdown continues, the rest of the country at Level 2 being reassessed next week. And this as a consequence of the second wave of the coronavirus after 102 COVID-free days. And we still don't know how it got into New Zealand. However, despite President Trump's weird attacks on New Zealand's containment efforts, New Zealand does have one of the lowest COVID-19 death rates. 0.45 for every 100,000 people compared to the US rate of over 53 deaths per 100,000. We'll hear more about what the US's failure to deal with COVID signifies from Wade Davis at around 9.40 this morning. He sees it as part of the unravelling of America, and he's written a polemic about it that's gone, if you'll excuse the expression, viral. Meanwhile, research is still throwing up new twists in this coronavirus story. Cambridge University virologist Dr Chris Smith is back to pick up the threads. Hi, Chris. Hello, Kim. We have been examining transmission. Can it, for example, be transmitted from an elevator button? Would aerosol particles last long enough in an elevator to infect a person coming in after a person with COVID has got out? What's the latest on transmission? Uh, This week, I had a really interesting conversation with a researcher at uh, Mount Sinai in New York. This is Nicole Bouvier. She's got a paper out in the journal Nature Communications this week. She's been looking at the question of, well, what does spread virus? Not just coronavirus, but for that matter, any respiratory virus. And she did these really interesting experiments with guinea pigs, Uh, not human guinea pigs, the actual rodent, the guinea pig. But they're a useful study subject. And one of the things they did was to ask, well, when a guinea pig just runs around in its cage, uh, how many particles come off of the guinea pig? And so they fed air that the guinea pigs were breathing into an analyzer that could look at the particles that are coming off and, and look at how many there were and also how big they were. And they were able to discriminate between particles the animals were breathing out and particles the animals were just producing from their body. Effectively, this is guinea pig dandruff. And yes, it produces humongous amounts of particulate matter from its skin, from its fur and so on. Then they infected the guinea pigs with flu. And not surprisingly, an infected guinea pig could pass the infection to an uninfected guinea pig. But when you exclude from the equation respiratory droplets, these are the things that we've obsessed about so far with coronavirus, worrying about what we're breathing and coughing out into the environment. They did their experiment in such a way that they could control for the respiratory droplets. They found very efficient transmission from animals from their coat to other animals. And the point she's making is that the virus... And coronavirus is very similar to flu in many respects. And so what goes for flu probably goes for the transmission of coronavirus as well. They're the same sorts of size of virus. They're the same sort of type of particle. They both would have come out of their respiratory tract. But in this instance, by putting the virus onto the coats of the animals, they were able to get efficient transmission. And so she's highlighting the fact that other things can ferry virus particles around in the air. So we ignore these things at our peril. For example, in hospital, when you've got people donning and taking off PPE, for example, it's possible to create a cloud, a bit like her guinea pigs, of virus particles on the dust that comes off of protective equipment. And the virus goes on those dust particles and travels around the air and can be breathed in by other individuals and can transmit. So a very interesting learning point this week that it's not just respiratory droplets we have to worry about because a person who's ill and, say, confines themselves to bed, they may be breathing out virus onto their bedding and then the partner comes along and gives the sheet a good shake or helps to fluff up, plump up the pillows or whatever, ejecting enormous amounts of virus into the air around that person potentially. So another thing to think about. For me, the big wake-up call... Another thing to worry about... Well, I was just going to say Sorry, the, big wake, the big wake up call for me, I think, has been in, in recent months, the realisation of quite how many people have this virus and have no symptoms whatsoever. And this is another major contribution to why we are seeing so many cases of this and why it's spread so efficiently around the world, because maybe two thirds of people 
have no symptoms whatsoever despite being infected and potentially being infectious, just like a person who does have symptoms. And early on in all of this, the thing we focused on were the symptoms. And we assumed, just like the flu, a person with symptoms is probably a person who's infectious, a person without symptoms is probably trivially infected and probably not passing the virus on. That turns out not to be the case. We're looking at the use of saliva testing, which may be more sensitive than the normal swab test. Research seems to have shown that these saliva tests can detect COVID-19 when nasal swabs have come up negative, and it's easy. That would help if it's true that cases are much more widespread than we realise. Uh, any test is is good to have as an additional adjunct. And the more tests that you have that you can compare and you can do trials and you can find out what the sensitivities and specificities are, the better. And also, as you say, it's easy to do some tests, easier to do some tests than others. This week, uh, I've been part of a, a study which has just published its first findings. I mentioned this before. We've sent hundreds of samples of patients who have covid to Western Australia, to Perth, to Murdoch University at the Australia National Phenome Centre campus. And they have processed these samples and we have found very interesting biochemical signatures which very specifically, in fact, we think the the specificity and sensitivity of the test that that, uh, we could make from our observations is about 100%. And it's very, very cheap and it takes about 10 minutes. So we think that uh, there are also very interesting possibilities in using the biochemistry in a person who's infected with COVID to produce a very sensitive test as well. So as far as I'm concerned, the more the merrier, because we'll find ways of detecting this faster, more cheaply and more efficiently. Chuck, loads of questions coming in, Chris. Let me address some of them. Are we any closer, says one listener, to understanding whether COVID infection conveys any protection against another strain in the future or will it operate more like the seasonal flu? The answer is we don't know because we don't know what's lurking out there but we do have some information which is a gift to us from the four other coronaviruses that circulate every year. There are four common coronaviruses, they've been with us for decades to hundreds even maybe thousands of years and they produce the common cold Uh, at least they're a contributor to the symptoms of the common cold. And one of them infects in a very similar way to the new coronavirus. It uh, looks for the ACE2 receptor on the surface of our cells. So we can use that as a proxy marker for how long do people make immunity against this coronavirus? How long does that immunity last? Does it confer immunity if you you are infected and exposed to that virus against re-encountering that virus? The answer actually isn't encouraging because it looks like the immunity wanes and is gone within a couple of years and people become susceptible to reinfection. If you extrapolate that to, does catching this mean that I won't catch the next thing coming? It probably means the answer is low. Uh, No, not really. You're probably not going to get much protection from uh, another type of virus if you encounter it into the future. But at the moment, we don't know. We don't know whether some people are getting very trivial infections with this coronavirus because they've had some kind of exposure, some kind of priming exposure to another similar virus in the past. And perhaps that's protecting them because they already have a very well-developed, very well-matured immune response. So when they encounter the new coronavirus, they're already tooled up and ready to go and they just suppress it and it it doesn't produce any symptoms. We don't know at the moment, but uh, we're trying to learn quickly. This next question goes to the transmission and the longevity of the virus. Um, There has been some suggestion, we've got an election coming up, that elderly voters are not keen on postal votes, which has been a suggestion, as they fear they might catch COVID off their mail. How possible is that? Uh, You can never say never in medicine, so there's never zero risk. You can never completely absent yourself from risk. But the risk in this circumstance is extremely low for a number of reasons. One, the virus is quite fragile. It doesn't persist on surfaces at room temperature and uh, normal humidity for that long. We're, We're talking hours at most under those circumstances. And the second point is that you've got to have an infectious dose present and you've got to be able to recover that infectious dose onto you and then get that infectious dose into your body. Now, most people are sensible enough not to eat their post. The dog does. and Dogs are susceptible to coronavirus, we think, but people generally not, unless they really don't like what's coming through the mail or it looks extremely tasty. So as a result, 
people are probably going to be very c- careful with their mail anyway. Most people are not in the habit of, of licking their fingers after they've opened their letters. So the chances of you being able to pick up an infectious dose of virus, having a, it arrive through the post, getting that on your skin and transferring that from your post to you is so slim that it's negligible. And so I think most people can be reassured if you are worried, get your post, open your post, wash your hands, having thrown away the bits you didn't want, and you'll be absolutely fine. This, um, a lot of people are worried about this. They, they um, are we- uh, in Auckland and they've been wearing a mask on the bus, which is uh, recommended in New Zealand, but not mandatory. And they say, I feel uneasy when I leave the bus. By this, I mean I have to push the stop button. I have to use the railing to lift myself up, steady myself. It's this hand contact I'm fearful of. They say, can people with COVID sweat it out of their hands onto bus surfaces? I I suspect that the sweating is not the issue. What do you say, Chris? Uh, As far as we can tell, you don't shed appreciable or even detectable amounts of coronavirus in your sweat. Sweat is made by filtering the liquid part of blood, the plasma out of blood in a sweat gland and secreting that fluid onto the skin surface. Because the amount of coronavirus which is present in circulation in in, a, in an average case is really low anyway, the chances of any of it making it across onto the skin surface via that route is so low it's negligible. The person, if they're, if they're infected with coronavirus, is going to be producing orders of magnitude more virus via the coughing, spluttering, sneezing and breathing route than they are via the sweating route. But as we alluded to at the start of this part of the programme, the study on the guinea pigs with flu shows that pretty much anything coming off your body, if you've been symptomatic and have transferred virus to your body, it could ferry virus away from your body. And that goes for contact with surfaces as well. And this is why people are being urged Always have in mind washing your hands or using hand cleanser or minimising your contact with surfaces to the greatest degree because if you can avoid touching surfaces that other people have touched, you can indeed transfer virus that way. We know that for a fact and the winter vomiting disease norovirus teaches that all too well every year. So if you can avoid touching a surface, I would. If you can't avoid touching the surface, just make sure you don't put your hands anywhere that uh, you, you don't want to, trans- to transfer virus to until you've washed them, cleansed them, or you've used some hand rub. Somebody says they've read that Invermectin has almost 100% cure rate when given to people recently infected and reduces death rate for people on ventilators from 80 to 40%. What do you know about that? Well, this is another one of these agents, a bit like the hydroxychloroquine story, where people have been trying a range of different substances, different drugs, to see if if you administer these to someone with a confirmed case of coronavirus, it could change the course of the disease. Now, a lot of claims were made for a lot of different things early on in the process because what was happening is small numbers of patients were being given these things in a non-standardised, non-proper clinical trial context. And as a result, there is a real risk of observation and publication bias. If you find it doesn't work, you don't tend to shout about it. If you find by chance that uh, what you've done works, you then uh, ascribe a causal relationship this drug caused me to get better, so I'm going to write about it. And so there's an, an amplification of, of, of that bias. We don't know yet whether or not uh, Ivermectin does actually have uh, a benefit to, to these people. It needs to be the subject of a proper clinical trial. And at the moment, we just don't know whether that's the case or not. We do know that, for instance, there is no evidence to support the use of hydroxychloroquine. That has now been properly scrutinised in the context of a proper clinical trial. The recovery trial run by Oxford University looked at this very carefully and found no evidence. And this is a finding that has been mirrored in other contexts. There is no evidence that that works. Um, But dexamethasone, the steroid drug, which was used as part of the same trial, that did show a strong benefit in people who are most severely unwell, and that can change the outcome by uh, reducing mortality by up to 30%. What we don't know at this stage, though, is with all these agents, what would happen if you intervened with them really early on in the course of the disease, would they make a difference then? And those things, those sorts of studies, A, haven't been done because who would take a drug if they didn't feel unwell, and B, even if that has happened, even by chance, the amount of data isn't sufficiently robust in order to give us strong statistics, uh, either yet or ever. So we just don't know at the moment. 
What's the latest on immunity? There's a story I saw in the New York Times, I think scientists have said that there could be lasting immunity to COVID-19, even after mild infections. Again, the jury's out because we've only known about this virus for eight and a bit months now. And therefore, the longest study period we've got to look at people who we know have definitely been infected with it is eight and a half months. The only exception to this is uh, Vladimir Putin, who last week seemed to have invented a crystal ball because at the press conference where he announced that Russia had got this successful vaccine and uh, they'd taken orders from 20 countries for a billion doses, uh, he then said, by some amazing pronouncement, that this would provide immunity for two years. Now, how he knows that, I have no idea because they've only had the vaccine for a, a month or two. So how on earth he knows about the future, and unless, of course, he knows something he's not telling us, then um, it's a mystery to me. But other than that, we don't, we just don't know at the moment. And the longest, because we can't speed up time, we can say is that you can study immunity for eight and a half months so far. We're going to have to wait and see. And do you s s have the same kind of uncertainty about the threshold for herd immunity? Well, uh, what we know about herd immunity, herd immunity is a term that means that if we give enough people in a population a vaccine or they are naturally challenged with an infection so they become immune to it, then eventually there are so few people who are left in society who are still susceptible that the distance in infectious transmission terms between the susceptible individuals is so great that the chances of a virus which is in a person at any one moment having the opportunity to interact and jump to another susceptible individual is so slim that you can't sustain a virus transmission chain. And as a result, individuals who are not immune or not vaccinated, and this would include people who can't have vaccines, people who are at high risk, newborn babies, individuals who don't make an immune response, those people are protected by the overall protection afforded by the herd and the inability of the virus to transmit through that group. Now, at the moment, we don't know what the threshold would be for herd immunity in the context of the coronavirus, but we do have some equivalent markers f and directional data for things like measles, mumps and rubella. We know that we have to get to about 95% of the population with a vaccine and that allows for uh, some people to be a vaccination failure. In other words, it just doesn't produce lasting immunity in those people, some people who don't have the vaccine, and that means that we probably get immunity in between 80 and 95% of the people who get vaccinated, and that produces the, the, the right threshold to keep those viruses at bay. So we'd probably we'll be need, looking we'll at similar sorts of We'll need to pick this up uh, uh, another morning, Chris, because we're out of time, but uh, uh, we'll think about that because some scientists have said that the threshold for herd immunity could be as low as 50%. But as you say, uncertain, only eight months of knowledge gone into this coronavirus so far. Chris Smith, thank you.